Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. And I want to welcome you to our September public lecture with Dr. Betsy Bryan, titled The Altered State of Religion, Sekhmet Ritual Revelries in the Reign of Amenhotep III. I'm Dr. Louise Bertini, and I'm the Executive Director of RC. For those of you who are new to RC, we are a private nonprofit organization whose mission is to support research on all aspects of Egyptian history, culture, foster a broader knowledge about public, and support American Egyptian cultural ties. As a nonprofit, we rely on RC members to support our work. So I first want to give a special welcome to our RC members who are joining us today. If you are not already a member and are interested in joining, I invite you to visit our website, rc.org, and learn more. We provide a suite of benefits to our members, including our private member-only lecture series. Our next member-only lecture will be on October 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern time with Iman Abdel Fattah of the University of Bonn and is titled Maurice Naman, Antiquities Collector, Dealer, and Authority. We are also having another member-only lecture on October 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Tara Prakash of the University of Charleston, titled Putting Them Back Together Again, The Story of the Old Kingdom Prisoner Statues at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the British Museum. Our next public lecture will be October 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time with Taylor Moore of the University of California Santa Barbara, who will be presenting on, uh, apologies, on the curse of the black eggplant, reconstructing occult economies in late Ottoman Egypt. Last but not least, RC National, along with the RC New York chapter, Archaeological Institute of America New York chapter, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, are co-hosting a special lecture on October 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in honor of International Archaeology Day with Dr. Mark Lehner, titled The People Who Built the Pyramids, How We Know. Details will be forthcoming later this week on how to register for this special event. So with now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Betsy Bryan for our lecture today. Uh, Dr. Bryan is the Alexander Badawi Professor of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at Johns Hopkins University. Her areas of specialization are history, art, and archaeology of the New Kingdom. Her current fieldwork is on the temple complex of the goddess Mut at South Karnak, and her research focuses on defining the earliest forms of Mut at Bishru. So i uh, hand it over to you, Dr. Bryan. Thank you very much, Louise. And I am very much happy to see everyone, uh, whatever time zone you're in. I look forward so much to the day when being truly face-to-face -face doesn't mean we can't enter someplace and doesn't elicit angry looks. I prefer that we can all be open-faced in ancient Egyptian wabai hair, which did not mean without a mask, but skillful and able to understand. I am here to talk to you about some ceremonies that the ancient Egyptians conducted more than 3,300 years ago. They were cultic revelries that included alcohol, drugs, and loud music, resulting in sexual hookups between participants in ways that some in Egyptian society were both skeptical of and found humorous, just as many of you would react today. Well, they're clearly ready to have a wild time. And you notice how Otter worked the group up to that, repeating toga, 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 until they're all on their feet. It'll be my aim to unpack. 
I am, I am stuck. There we go. Um, <clears throat> it will be my aim to unpack these Egyptian festivities and look at the roles played by the gods, kings, and various ranks of participants in our existing documentation. The religious environment of the 15th century BC, when Amun-Re was the premier deity, is our backdrop, and we'll see that drunken festivities were very popular for some 120 years in the 18th dynasty. We'll see that in religious, other religious trends, including ancestor veneration, <clears throat> uh, was woven into the festivals and we'll exam that we'll examine. We'll also see growing personal piety focused on the sun god. All of these religious trends were cohabiting in ancient Thebes. And after we mention them, I will propose how I believe that these religious festivals were manipulated and redirected to further the specific aims of the king, royal family, and court under Amenhotep III's rule. I'm leading with the goddess Sekhmet, an alter ego of the great goddess Hathor. I've worked at the precinct of the goddess Mut Sekhmet Bastet for 20 years, where there are hundreds of granite statues of Sekhmet placed there in the reign of Amenhotep III. We'll return to those later, but due to discoveries we've made at the Moot Temple, I have found myself trying to understand the worship of that goddess in the New Kingdom. Between 2004 and 2007, our expedition from the Johns Hopkins University with the Supreme Council of Antiquities uncovered beneath the temple's west side the column drums of a pillared hall dedicated by Queen Hatshepsut and her young nephew, stepson, Thutmose III, and identified as a monument for Moot as a porch or hall of drunkenness. The longer text on the left says, she made it as a monument for her mother Moot, mistress of Isheru, making for her a columned portico of drunkenness anew that she might perform given life. This represented a space for the celebration of the so-called festivals of drunkenness, known well from the Moot precinct, but for some 1200 years after Hatshepsut's demise. Likewise, these festivals are very well known for the goddess Hathor and are richly referred to on her temple walls at Dendera. Superb scholars such as John Darnell have elucidated much about the elements of the celebrations, particularly noting the importance of Hathor, the golden one, a reference to her as the sun. Hathor's connection to other, two other aspects are essential. First, as the Eye of Re, her role in maintaining the world and the gods representative in it, the king of Egypt. Hathor was a solar goddess, the Eye of Re, his agent in the world. In many ways for him and for the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, she kept the mechanisms of the world running. Particularly, this means the annual flood cycle. And celebrations of drinking, whether of beer or wine, allude to the river and the fertile green fields that it guaranteed each year and also to the numerous plants and flowers that are part or edge the river itself. A song from the New Kingdom captured this notion quite specifically. The river is wine, ta its reeds, Sekhmet its lotus leaf, Yadet its lotus bud, and Nefertem its lotus flower. The song also indicates what was added to the wine when it was consumed at banquet. Second, in practice, Hathor's role as the Eye of Re was generally subcontracted to goddesses envisioned in lyre and form or associated with the cobra Urei, protecting the forehead of the king himself. For example, Sekhmet, Reyet Tawi, Bastet, Nekbet, Wajet, and Tefnut, the so called faraway goddesses. Just as lionesses are the primary food hunters and caretakers for lion prides, these goddesses ensured the food sources and the fertility of Egypt on behalf of the sun god and the king. Myths associated them with the slaughter of mankind, 
which the sun god instructed Hathor in the form of the lion Sekhmet to carry out. As the far away ones, lioness deities were said to have wandered away from the Nile Valley and were believed to need enticements to return and bring with them once again the great floods of the Nile. The story of the destruction of mankind contained within the religious book of the heavenly cow told of how Sekhmet's bloodthirst was quenched by drowning the fields of Upper Egypt with beer stained red to attract her violent lust. The connection of this myth to the drunkenness festival, wherein the goddess is offered this reddened brew called menu, is rather undeniable. Yet it is surely combined with allusions in, in the myth of the sun's, sun's eye, so far only well preserved in late copies, but preferred to both textually and visually already in the New Kingdom. The faraway goddess called Tefnut, the moon goddess in, late example, in the late example, was lured back to Egypt by a dog ape identified with Thoth, and her return ensured the proper maintenance of the sun god's creation on earth. Since we've connected Sekhmet and the lioness associations of Hathoric deities to the festivals, let's look more closely at the celebrations using both late and earlier materials. Amun-Re was the national god of Egypt and the recipient of, to pun a little, the lion's share of royal patronage, frequently resulting from booty and tribute derived from imperial conquests south to Sudan and north as far as modern Syria. The great god Amun-Re of Karnak benefited from the ruler's largesse at Karnak, Luxor, and other temple sites. The state religious worship was hierarchical in form and viewed only by a handful of clergy who opened his shrine each day to conduct ritual. There was nothing that we might call congregational worship in the interior of the temple. And the personnel themselves were highly stratified in their organization, although the professional clerics were supplemented by civilians who served in inherited part-time priestly roles. However, Amun Re left his sanctuary during festivals and traveled with, within his shrine placed on a boat to more accessible parts of his temple and also to a variety of temples around Thebes. At those times, the populace lined the streets and joyfully participated in the excitement of the god among the people. The worship of Sekhmet, Mut, and other Hathoric deities in the drunkenness festivals, however, took place at two primary feasts in Thebes in the Ptolemaic era and likely in the New Kingdom. According to the Ptolemaic calendar on the entrance gate to the Mut temple, the first revelries took place in the very first month of the civil year, in the month of Thoth, day 20, most often. This is the primary festival of drunkenness at Dendera, Hathor's home temple. Many months later, in the time of harvest, or Shemu, appears this entry. Beer tinted with red pigment overflows at the time of this festival of the valley. It's more exalted than blood, being the work of Menket, the beer goddess, to cheer Moot's heart out of her anger. The Valley Festival was a celebration of potential fertility coming with the inundation. It celebrated the potential return of the dead in a daily rebirth. The specific reference to the red and brew in the calendar here clearly connects the Valley Festival in the second month of Shemu with the mythological story of Sekhmet's slaughter of mankind. We know that the beautiful Feast of the Valley as the Drunkenness Festival took place routinely and annually through much of the 18th dynasty. So thanks to a combination of sources, both contemporary to the 18th dynasty and later, we can outline elements of the Drunkenness Festivals as they were observed both inside the temple proper by kings or high priests and in processional locations in the cemetery landscape of the Theban West. From the temple of Amun-Re in Karnak, the god traveled from his sanctuary and joined with Mut to, jo to journey across the Nile. 
The king's figure is seen in the processions from Karnak to Deir al-Bahri, and he not only escorts the god on his travel, but also participates in rituals to ensure a pure and propitious festival period. He demonstrates his fitness in ritual running, and once the procession reaches its destination at Hatshepsut's temple of Jezer Jezeru, he participates in rituals there. The funerary temple of Hatshepsut at Deir al-Bahri, where also the goddess Hathor had a local home associated with her perceived residence within the limestone cliffs, was named Holy of Holies, Jezer Jezeru. Other deceased rulers' mortuary temples were also named as places where the god might visit and rest for a time, meaning that his boat and statue were brought there and housed temporarily. But Jezer, as it was often called, was the primary destination. In the Hathor Chapel at Deir al-Bahri, the king was depicted conducting the ritual of striking the ball, Seker Hema. His actions sent the evil eyes of the sun god's enemy, Apophis, associated with the balls here, hurtling away from endangering the world that the king must preserve on behalf of the god. Hathor was frequently called the Lady of Drunkenness, just as she is so profoundly at Dendera and at the Mood Temple across the river. The king's role in striking the ball defeated the enemies of the sun god to ensure a cosmic stability. Yet beyond rituals conducted at the temple, little can be said about the role of the king other than in processions to and from the temple. The remainder of the valley festival was devoted to two primary aims. First, communion with the goddess by the festival participants in order to urge her continued love for the king and her protection of him from his enemies. And second, communion and visitation with ancestors, royal and non-royal, as they enjoy the festival drink and food. In this tomb from the left, we see the owner of, of, and his, of the tomb and his wife receiving the ritual prayers of a priest behind whom are the deceased parents of the tomb owner, and behind them, the family and friends, living and dead, all together at a banquet of communion. This ensured the ancestors' positive involvement with their family and friends still on earth, as well as their helpful intercession, along with that of the deceased rulers. Inside the temples, formal requests to the goddess would take place in the open courtyard before the main interior shrines. At the Temple of Hathor, that may have been in the court before the Hathor Chapel, which you see here, or in the open court of the top tier of Deir al-Bahri, where scenes of the Valley Festival procession appear. At the Mut Temple, the open court behind the pylon would have been the gathering place just in front of Hatshepsut's portico of drunkenness, <clears throat> located very likely on the west side of the original temple. From the hymn inscribed in the temple of Metamud, invoking the Uraeus lioness goddess Rayet Tawi, the order of ceremony and the personnel in the Ptolemaic era is known. So we can make some general observations of how this beautiful feast of the valley began in Hatshepsut's time and then traveled to the west. In late June in her reign, this communal gathering began in the evening with the lamps being lit. The Meta Mud hymn begins, Come, O Golden One, who eats of praise, because the food of her desire is dancing, who shines on the festival at the time of lighting the lamps who's content with the dancing at night. Come, the procession is in the place of drunkenness, that hall of traveling through the marshes. Its performance is set, its order is in effect without anything lacking in it. Now it continues by telling us who the participants were. When the royal children pacify you with what is desired, the officials multiply the reversion offerings for you. 
When the lector priest exalts you in intoning a hymn, the magician recites the order of ritual. When the organizer praises you with his lotus blossoms, the percussionists take up the tambourine. The female youths rejoice for you with garlands, the young women with wreath crowns. The drunken celebrants drum for you during the cool of the night with the result that those who awaken bless you. We cannot be certain whether there was in any way a perfect match between the participants in the Ptolemaic era in the 18th dynasty. However, it was likely quite similar. It's not surprising to find that the chief ritualist here who chants the hymn is a lector priest, not the high priest of the Metamud temple. The magician, one who knows things, writes the ritual, recites the ritual, these are people who have roles that go well beyond temple boundaries, and that was necessary in these festivals, which required the appropriate knowledge and control of magical practices, but were also familiar with funerary practice. The identity of the officiants and the communal nature of the gathering of men and women strongly point to the source of these celebrations in the kinship system and ancestor veneration rather than the state. The other classifications named were part of temple groups, professional musicians, whom we, should, we see as small orchestras in all periods. Those referred to as the drunken celebrants were not disparaged by this label. Rather, it indicated those who participated fully. The participants in the time of Hatshepsut were among the highest elites including the high priest of Amun, the second priest, the steward of Senenmut, and a variety of others. The order of the festivities required that all took place at evening and the participants were gathered to hear the intoned chanting as they donned scented garlands and received from young women copious amounts of alcohol, heavily laced with various plant additives. Lotus was one of those plants and produced some sleepiness, but laudanum was also used in Dendera's drink for Hathor. The importance of the additives even affected the writing of the word drunkenness in the Metamud hymn, where it's determined by the lotus blossom. In a variety of elite tombs of the 18th dynasty, we see those serving the alcohol also dangling small vessels from their fingers. These would have contained the pressed oils of the plants that produce soporific and other neural effects on the drinkers. The tiny dangling vessels are a frequent element in banquet scenes. And in Theban tomb 17 of Neb Amun, we see the server pouring the contents from that small pitcher into the drinking cup. The recipient holds an unusually large lotus, a common feature in banquet scenes and likely suggestive here of a variety of uses. Most of the participants here at the banquets drank and then drifted into intoxicated sleep, while some may have wandered away to have sexual encounters before sleeping. But this was not the end of the temple service. As the hymn from Meta Mud says, the drumming drunken celebrants awaken the others who are both now inebriated and sleepy and most susceptible to suggestion. Now there is music accompanied by acrobatic dancing carried out by the so-called Libyan dancers. As seen at Dero Bahri on the slide, they used rhythmic clappers that made loud staccato knocking sounds carefully choreographed with the music and dancing. Following this, the hymn introduces a variety of animals and fantastic beasts that praise the goddess. Here we have come into the ecstatic visions produced after the long night of intoning, drumming, drinking, singing, and dancing. The lector, magician, and organizer control the pace and set the stage for the remainder of the ceremony. It's interesting here to pause and briefly consider the Egyptian festival's use of mind-altering substance, substances and its communal organization in a broader setting. 
Ceremonies around the world, ancient and current, have relied on alcohol and a variety of plants to assist in spiritual experiences. Particularly in Central and South America, shamans or experienced healers lead a communal gathering through the consumption of strong drugs and have them experience visions during the period, often of very similar types. It's interesting to find that the shamans, for example, the Wehol Indians of North Central Mexico and tribes in Amazonic Peru, <clears throat> use not only a choice of drugs to control, but also music and other rhythmic sounds, along with a rich variety of smells, tastes, and visions. To quote Dobkin de Rios, who worked with the Peruvians, rattles, singing, chanting, and vocal productions in general may be very important part of the hallucinogenic experience. She continues to note that olfactory, tactile, auditory, and gustatory senses are all present and no doubt affected by the music. Other researchers have found that synesthesias are common, that is that participants heard the chants or certain music, but smelled and tasted certain substances as a response. The types and uses of the music allowed healers to bring the communicants into their ecstatic journeys and also to bring them out. The specific sounds and rhythms acting as cues, not unlike the concomitant uses of incense and bells in many types of modern worship. It would not surprise us then to think of the Egyptian versions of altered state ceremonies as highly sophisticated and carefully choreographed as was described in the Meta Mood hymn. At the climactic moment of the awakening of the celebrants, the goddess joined the group in some manner here perhaps in the form of a Hathor drinking goblet. The participants could see the goddess and songs tell us, experience a moment across the human world meeting that of the divine. This was the formal aim of the drunkenness ceremonies carried out at tombs on the West Bank, where the participants might drink and be carried into a communion with the goddess Hathor and with their deceased family members. At Dendera, the epiphany of the non-temple community with the goddess provided them with the opportunity to make a direct request to the goddess. And these were of two types, a request for Hathor's love for the king and all the people, and second, for her destruction of the king's enemies and his protection from them at all times. In the Mut temple, the high priest of Amun, Hapu Seneb, left a statue of himself with a hymn on it to Mut Sekhmet that provides one very specific request made to the goddess during that moment of epiphany. It asks her to awaken peacefully, which meant, as Goyon and others have stated, without anger at those whom you will join. But then the inscription does not ask for her love and joy, but rather states, may you awaken propitiated, may the pestilence which is upon your mouth and the slaughter which is upon your lips awaken. It continues to refer to a very specific concern that Hatshepsut has placed before the god already, the goddess already. May you judge this matter which the king, Matkare, has spoken to you. O Sekhmet, may you be powerful of heart be powerful indeed over those who hate her. Does this suggest that the queen herself was present at the communion epiphany and that her request was then monumentalized by the high priest of Amun? We can't say, but there is little doubt that this ritual was one considered highly important and highly relevant for Hatshepsut, who built the portico of drunkenness for its celebration in the Mut temple at Der al Bahri and in the reign of this ruler, this was serious worship. But what of the celebration of the beautiful Feast of the Valley on the west of the city? After the royal procession has reached Der al Bahri and festivities have been enacted there, the god goes to another funerary temple to rest, and often that is, is of the current ruler. This occasions gatherings in elite tombs where there were offerings burned on braziers and then banqueting and true drinking, 
drinking feast to achieve the experience of the goddess. In the tomb of the high priest of Amun, um, Men Kepere Seneb, the priest receives the gifts from the temples where Amun had visited. A number of banqueting scenes in other tombs make specific an invocation to become drunk. In Theban tomb 85 of Amenemheb, a male server requests that he imbibe, saying, for your ka, a perfect drunkenness, make festival. In the tomb of Horonhab, a military scribe in the reign of Thutmose IV, the song of the musicians is written above the seated recipients at the banquet and is the most complete version of what the Valley Festival drunkenness intended. For your ka, make festival in your beautiful house of eternity, in the place of everlasting, a beautiful harp being in your hand. Tie on the wah collar, rub on fine ointments, and join the festival being joyful, your heart in exultation. As you see Amun, may he cause that you be among the sun people, being a praised one in the land of the living. But Moot has returned as the faraway one of the beautiful face in order to cause her sistrum players to cry out, desiring drunkenness from a goblet of gold. The song refers to the ecstatic viewing of the goddess Moot from the goblet, the drunkenness festival having enticed her to return. It encourages the festivities described in the Meta Mud hymn. The goblets of gold held by the female offerer can be equated with the golden one herself, Hathor, and the goddesses associated with her. This language is remarkably close to that found in the demotic drinking songs written down more than 1200 years later. All those who come to worship Nehemanit within the temple, when they are drunk, they will see the merit goddess by means of the goblet. At this time and well into the reign of Amenhotep III, we can find representations from tombs of scenes linked to the beautiful feast of the valley. We see it here on, on the right in the tombs of Mena and on the left in the sculptors Neb Amun and Apuki. And the scenes of banqueting that include both the living and dead appear to continue unabated. However, it was always the case that the drunkenness was not desired by all banqueters. And those refusing are depicted on tomb walls just as were the recipients of the wine. Contemporary with these drinking revelries, some found communion with the gods in a personal fashion and called upon them to intercede directly, thus perhaps avoiding the communal gatherings as a mechanism. In the song above, there's an allusion to viewing of Amun, not by means of the goblet, but by seeing him in the sky. In the middle of the dynasty, the swelling of personal piety that elicited hymns and prayers by individuals addressed to the great national gods was on the rise. The joy of viewing the sun god was not infrequently compared to the experience of drinking. An ostracon or small prayer found uh, in near the tombs in Sheikh Abdul Gorna dates to the middle of the 18th dynasty. And it says, O Amun, come to me in peace so that I might see the beauty of your face, the perfect face of Amun that the entire land beholds. The people view it until drunkenness, more than every beautiful red complexion. Such personal calls to the god were more formally placed in hymns to the sun that were painted or carved on the entrance doorways to elite tomb chapels and greeted the rising and setting sun, requesting the tomb owner's association with the daily solar cycle for eternity. In addition, there were no doubt those who did not take seriously the divine epiphany that was attributed to the family drinking feast. In fact, None of the tomb inscriptions mention a communal request to the goddess, so relevant to the gatherings later and at the tomb moot temple. Rather, always it was the seeing that was the stated aim, as might be understood, since this was in many ways a festival of ancestor veneration, and communion with family was paramount. 
The sexual behavior of the revelers, despite, despite being encouraged in demotic drinking songs, may have contributed to a more secular and jocular attitude by some. The next couple of slides do have a very uh, clear uh, sexual imagery, just giving you the heads up. <clears throat> Graffiti in unfinished tombs in the hill above and around Dar el Bahri show indications that revelers visited during the festival period. And in at least one tomb, a body drawing on wood was left showing a priest in a very unseemly fashion grasping a female musician. This humorous view of the drunkenness festivals continued to surface in the later New Kingdom, as we see on the famed Turin papyrus. To summarize, our lengthy look at the drunkenness feasts in Thebes of the 15th century from about 1480 until around 1360, some 120 years, the beautiful Feast of the Valley was celebrated as a Hathoric festival connected with Mut Sekhmet that resulted in communion with the goddess, with Amun-Re, and with deceased ancestors. It did this by means of, by the use of mind-altering alcoholic drinks, assisted by rhythmic and trancing music, and eventually ecstatic visions. The deities were the most visible focus of these festivities, less so the rulers, although they conducted rituals and invited Amun-Re to rest in their funerary temples. And how does this then change in the time of Amenhotep III? First, the accent on drunkenness does appear to decrease in the tombs of the time of Amenhotep III, as does the primary role of Hathor, Mut, Sekhmet, being supplanted by vaguer references to seeing Amun at his beautiful festival. This difference was noted already by Siegfried Schott, when he discussed the beautiful feast 70 years ago. But in general, the shift has been attributed to Akhenaten's religion having caused the cessation of the Valley Festival, at least until the post-Amarna era. The festivals continued to visit Dar al-Bahri, but a statue of Neferenpet, Amenhotep III's butler, suggests that changes have come. Like Amenhotep, son of Hapu, whose statues became intercessors for petitioners at the temple of Amun-Re of Karnak, Neferenpet's statue was accepting the festival requests made to Hathor at the Hathor Chapel in Deir el-Bahri. The skirt text included the following, everything which goes forth on the altar of Hathor, mistress of the necropolis for the Ka of the royal butler, he says, I am the sistrum player for my mistress, the herald of the lady of truth, who causes that the petition of every person ascends to the golden in the interior of her sanctuary. So the direct addresses at the time of divine epiphanies are suddenly short-circuited and sent into a route ultimately controlled by the king. More significantly, Amenhotep III's funerary temple, Stila, does indeed refer to the beautiful Feast of the Valley and clarifies how the king includes Amun's visit to the west. Quote, making for him a very great pylon opposite Amun. Its nickname, which his, his majesty made, is the arbor of Amun, which elevates his beauty a resting place for the Lord of the Gods at his festival of the valley, during the procession of Amun of the West for the viewing of the Gods of the West. We note here that there is neither a reference to Deir el-Bahri nor to Hathor, but to the Gods of the West, whom Amenhotep III may well have been installing in his own funerary temple as an alternative way to celebrate the valley fest. Second, the accent on the sun god and the personal connection seen in hymns and prayers of personal piety continued, but was also a focus of royal ideology in the reign. 
the king brought solar elements into nearly every cult that he supported and celebrated that aspect of Amun Re and as the time went on of himself as the representative of the sun god on earth. <clears throat> Komel Hetan, the funerary temple of Amenhotep III, devoted to Amun Re. On a stela there, he says, Come, Amun Re, Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands, foremost of Karnak, so that you may see your temple which I have made for you on the west bank of Thebes. As you rise in the horizon of heaven, it is illuminated with the gold of your face. Here, Amun Re is purely the sun in the sky, and note, that he refers to Amun as the gold in the sky, specifically an epithet of Hathor. At the same time in his 30th year, as his 30th year approached, <clears throat> bringing the said festival renewal of his, this king, the king supported by his court associated himself as closely as possible with the sun god. As Ray Johnson and others have illustrated, the imagery of this king's reign was dominated by sun disks and solar cobras, as we can easily as we can easily see here, <clears throat> showing by showing a few statues and relief scenes of the king. At Luxor Temple, we see his crowns being conferred by Amun Re. On the left, he wears the crown of Atum, and on the right a solarized Atef crown. Amenhotep III's Hebsed began on the first day of the second month of Shemu in year 30. That is the beginning of the festival of the valley. The second month of Shemu, day one. Indeed, there is no indication that the Valley Festival was celebrated separately that year. So we might ask, why was Amenhotep III so devoted to Sekhmet that he lined both his funerary temple and the Mut temple with statues of that goddess? As Goyon and Germain have demonstrated, Sekhmet's role in maintaining the mechanisms of the world also made her the principal support for the ruler in his similar responsibility. Propitiation of the goddess was necessarily to ensure that she sat peacefully and provided that assistance to the king and the people. So here the king takes the role of Ray in placing the wedgeot eye on his forehead, that is the uraeus in this case, but it demonstrates that the king could bring the order needed and demonstrate it to the sun god himself. As Zoyat has suggested, the Sekhmet statues placed at Amenhotep III's two temples provided a permanent litany to the goddess, requesting her kindness and obedience to the rule of Re. Let's then look at the calendar for the said festival and how the king has used elements of various feasts to conduct his renewal. Amenhotep III's 30th year of reign was approximately 1360 BC. In the second month of Parrot, day 29, which was around February 5th to 10th at that time, he began offerings for Sekhmet, the litanies associated with the statues of the goddess at both his temples of Mut and his funerary temple. And these would have continued until the fourth month of Parrot, day 26, when the illumination of the dais took place at a ritual in Soleb Temple in Sudan, and perhaps in Thebes, and this lasted until the first day of Shemu, either five or six days later. In Thebes, the harvest festival began on the first day of the first month of Shemu, as we learn in the tomb of Kaimhet, the overseer of granaries who was responsible for the bumper crop at the harvest of year 30. On the first day of the month of the second month of Shemu, approximately May 10th or 12th, which appears also to have been Amenhotep III's accession date, the Heb said began and lasted until the second day of the third month of Shemu, more than a month. In Sudan, at the temples of Soleb and Sedinga, both Amenhotep III and his wife T were equated with aspects of the sun and the moon. The connection of T with Tefnut, the faraway goddess, 
who had run away to Nubia, was plainly depicted where she appears as the Sphinx. So the pair were associated with the myth of the sun's eye, but not with the destruction of mankind and its drunkenness theme. In Thebes, a new formality appeared in the elite tombs that replaced the sensuality of the many banquet scenes earlier. As depicted in the tomb of Kerouef, the king presided over a variety of festivities that depicted him in the role of the sun god, but also expressed harvest and fertility aspects of the valley festival, normally celebrated at this time. The song here focuses the ecstatic dancing on the sun god, with the dancers turning their heads up to view the sun. The tombs of Kerouef and Ramos, the best preserved examples, represent slightly different moments, but both have the elements that derived from the king's concentrated focus. Kerouef's completed section was a portico showing the first and third said festivals of the king. The accent on the ruler, ruler certainly presages elite tombs at Amarna. <clears throat> In Ramos, a full wall north and south of the entrance depicts guests at banquets, some of whom were famous at the time, including Amenhotep, son of Hapu, whom you see here in the center. However, he was already deceased at the time of the making of the tomb, so his appearance, as well as that of Ramo's parents, continued the communion of banquet rituals with ancestors, without, however, any reference to drunkenness. Finally, at his funerary temple, the king provided the populace with a means of divine communion built upon the ancestor veneration and deceased ruler intercession that was familiar already. Suzanne Bikel has written wisely on this, distinguishing the state's approach and that of the populace. It is the contention here that the ruler planned for the need for divine communion by influencing how elites could interact through ritual. At the funerary temple, he placed colossal statues of himself as part of statue cults in his name. The Colossus of Memnon was named Nebmat Re is the ruler of rulers, but there were also smaller figures with similar names. A granodiorite figure of the king was also named ruler of rulers as the inscription on the rear says. So the king became the chief intercessory and could then also become the focus of all the people's personal worship. At the close of this period, the king was the focus of, of the worship. And eventually, Hathor was even became his helpmate together with Amenhotep III's wife, T, as they appear in the tomb of Kerouef. The goddess Sekhmet stayed in the king's temples to guarantee his role as the sun god's representative in maintaining the world, and the king was as close to a sun god as he could be. His cults would replace the need for ancestor intercession, and at least for a time, cultic revelries celebrated communion that had celebrated communion with family are now represented by the king as a sun god. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for that very interesting lecture. Uh, I want to invite anybody who has questions uh, to please place them in the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. And we do have our first question from Cynthia, who is asking, uh, didn't the lotus open in the morning and close in the evening, suggesting the banquet would be a morning event? Well, we know very specifically that the banquets are at night. Um, and. Uh, 
lotuses did open at different times. The blue and the white actually opened differently. Um, so the how they might have appeared in an actual banquet, open or closed, is probably of less significance to the attendance at a uh, uh, at the banquet. And when we see them as open flowers, it's much more likely that that's the way they wished them to be appearing, whether or not it was day or night. But we know that this took place in the evening. I have a question. Um, it's from Anonymous, a trivial question, but just wondering how the beer was dyed red. Uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Well, on the calendar at the Moot Temple, they refer to it being dyed with a mineral called DD. Um, in most cases, red pigment was ochre, so ferrous oxide. Um, and so it probably was a mineral um, dye that was used. Question from Susan. Are there any residues of wine laced with lotus or opiates in the portico of drunkenness or in other places where the festival of drunkenness was celebrated? Can, can you just say that one more time? I missed the. Are, are there any, any? Are there any residues of wine laced oh. with lotus or opiates in the portico of drunkenness or in other places where the festival of drunkenness was celebrated? Okay, good. Um, so um, the, the quick answer would be no. Um, but one of the problems we have is actually getting something that would preserve it. Um, in the, among the things that I showed in this um, presentation was a, a drinking vessel that actually was found underneath one of the column parts when we found the uh, the columns of the festival of the drunkenness porch, um, but unfortunately there was nothing that we could get to test from it. Um, and certainly there are herbs of various sorts that can be found in a number of uh, of vessels that have been found, but we would know the answer is. I can't guarantee that we have such anywhere, uh, but we certainly have plenty of references to it. Question from Donald. Can you expand on your comments on the connection between the red flavored beer and the waters of the flooding of the Nile? Well, the idea of a uh, connection of, uh, of any liquid that the Egyptians might drink um, was something that connected symbolically um, with the Nile. So we will see that referred to um, in many, many different contexts. Um, and when you had a festival that was associated with the coming um, inundation, um, the drinking of the liquid um, was often referred to throughout, um, they would make a point of bringing in the Nile, of bringing in the fertility of the Nile. Um, so the, um, the, the fact of the red wine and the red beer um, is more to do with the myth than the Nile itself. But the connection of the drink um, is a reference to the liquid and its ability to uh, revive people. Have another uh, red beer question. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, is, what is the name of the red and beer? Menu. Oh. Uh, question from Scott. In TT57, I noticed that the Egyptian used the jugulate determinative for the Tech Festival. Were there other determinatives used besides the jugulate and lotus blossom for writing this festival? I think those are the primary ones. I'm certainly not going to say that there's not, that there wouldn't have been. Um, 
but I do think that the, the jug is certainly the most common um, determinative and certainly in the New Kingdom that would have been the most common one. Um, so, but I don't actually know of any others. Um, I haven't gone to look, you know, the word tech is also the word for balance. Um, and so you will get the word tech with a scale, but that's a different word. I have a question from Ben. What are your thoughts on the theory that Amenhotep III built statues to Sekhmet to placate the goddess in response to a pandemic affecting Egypt? <laughs> I wondered if I was going to get that question. <laughs> um, you know, I am. Um, I, I in. I never try to uh, you know rule out a possibility. Um, it by no means is it impossible that there was in fact um, uh, a, um, a major plague. Um, in fact, I, I think there's probably good, good reason to think there, there was. Um, its connection to the making of the Sekhmet statues, however, I consider to be dubious. Um, the um, the no, the amount of uh, of time that went into this um, w has to have been far more related to planning for this king's said festival, which he started almost certainly um, a decade before it came, or at least most of a decade. Um, so the fact that they might have operated um, as part of a healing um, uh, litany. Certainly, I think that's entirely possible, but I don't believe that that's the reason that they were made. A uh, question from Melissa. Can you please discuss the source of laudanum used in the drinking festival? And thank you for a wonderful talk. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I don't know that I know the source. Um, the at Dendera, the the material is is uh, that is translated as laudanum is called eber, and has been discussed by a variety of people, including Renata Germer. Um, and um, but I assume that it must be um, available uh, in Egypt. I can't say that laudanum was part in the 18th dynasty um, of, the, of the materials that were used in wine and beer, um, only that it was definitely referred to um, in the Ptolemaic uh, texts. Question from Mary. How is drunkenness reconciled with the balance of moot? <clears throat> with the balance of mood. Um, so um, drunkenness is, um, it, it was something that um, made, in, in a ritual sense, was something that made people happy and made deities happy. Um, it, was, uh, it was something that they believed was a way of pleasing um, and propitiating this goddess um, when she was angry. Um, Moot, um, Moot herself was, I'm just, I, do you think it's possible we could get I a think, little bit? I, I think actually I did just see a clarification. I think she okay. was asking the balance of Ma'at, not Moot. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. I, I later I scrolled down and then I saw a, another question. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, um, so the question is um, how to how is drinking this? All right, so um, I've actually um, commented on that um, in in uh, in earlier publication, um, where we do actually have in the tomb of Rekmire um, an image. Uh, of musicians and guests at a banquet where the, um, the, 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 the guest is saying in a sort of hymn-like form, um, is it mot? Is it correct 
um, to desire drunkenness. And at that moment, as Henry Fisher pointed out decades ago, without any reference to the actual festival itself, he was talking about the direction that hieroglyphs run. He pointed out that there is the hieroglyph for Mott, um, the actual goddess, and that it faces the person who is saying, is it right to desire drunkenness? And as Fisher pointed out, that that was the way of saying, uh, of saying yes to the answer to that question. Um, so the, the balance was reasonable only in that correct ritual context. And certainly it would not have been ma'at to be drunk on the streets, for example. I uh, have a question from Scott. It's a, a two-part question. Um, were there events other than the tech festival uh, in which mind altering substances were used. And during the festival, was sexual activity restricted to the priest or populace or both? Those are good questions. <clears throat> um, okay, so the first one was were there other festivals? Um, I think there's a very good reason to think that um, the New Year's festival. Um, operated in some locations as a, uh, a, a drunkenness festival. Um, it, it certainly seems to be the case at, uh, at El Kaab, where we have the, in the tomb of Pahiri. Um, that is, uh, Nekbet is a Uraeus goddess, but that does appear to be a New Year's festival that is depicted at that banquet. Um, and that might very well have been the case as well um, in, in Thebes, um, but because the calendar at the Moot Temple only specifies two, I am shying away from including more than that um, uh, until there's more uh, to go on. Um, okay, remind me what the second one was. The second part was about sexual activity. Was it restricted to the priests, the populace, or both? Okay, great. Um, so it, it's hard to say, um, I, I really don't think we know the answer to that question. The demotic drinking songs, um, that we have, which are very late date, do talk about, um, um, a particular member of the community, um, who is encouraged, um, to have sex. Um, and um, however, the, in the, from the earlier material, we don't have anything that specifically encourages it, uh, nor does it occur in the Metamud hymn. Um, the demotic drinking songs are in fact from house churches, one might say. They're from people who gathered in small groups in, in homes. Um, so their festivities may very well have been much looser. Um, but that's the reason why I, I bring in these graffiti, which we have. And I only showed ones that are really apparently connected more to the 18th dynasty. We have far more than that from uh, the Ramesid period and, and from Darrow and Medina. Um, so the question is, that I the the truth is I can't answer um, whether uh, whether they were specific people who did this and who were appointed to do so. Uh, nothing suggests that that I can see um, so far. Question from Solange: uh, I would love to know more about the herbal concoctions added to the beer. Um, other than lotus and launum, are there any others? You know, I'm not, I, there are. Um, <laughs> and um, unfortunately, I don't have them on the tip of my tongue, but I'm happy to be able to send you uh, uh, the things. It's um, Sylvie Coville um, uh, talks about this at some length in her uh, uh, Festator. 
um, and um, they are long lists of the things that were utilized um, in, in addition to laudanum and and and, uh, uh, and lotus. So it's it's easily done. Question from Peter. Uh, the majority of specialized goblets for the Festival of Drunkenness seem to be of the same form. Are there other types uh, that might be in existence and where might one find the best resources on those? Um, well, I think one good place um, to, to, to look actually would be um, at the terrific uh, catalog that the uh, Metropolitan Museum did um, on Hatshepsut some years ago. So, um, I think it's called Hatshepsut from Queen to Pharaoh. Um, they have a section in there on these faience bowls, um, the iconography of which um, in the mid 18th dynasty is quite consistently um, devoted to either imagery of Hathor herself um, or to <clears throat> or to Lotus. Um, so that would be um, a place uh, to get started and uh, if you're uh, if you're interested. Uh, question on how do you know the festival banquet took place at night? What is the evidence? It, the evidence is coming from the hymn. Um, which says that they're getting together at the time of lighting the lamps. Uh, question from Hala. Uh, do you suggest that the heating the ball ritual was practiced during the festival or only symbolic by drawing on temple walls? Yeah, I'd love to know the answer to that question myself. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's one that pleases me very deeply because um, that particular ritual also occurs in the context of, uh, of the drink, drunkenness festival at Dendera. Um, so when it pops up at the Hathor Chapel um, in Dero Bahri, that's meaningful. But Yes, the question is, do you know, do we see him swinging for the American League or the National League? I, I really don't know. Um, I would love to know. And I, the Egyptians were highly performative. So it's not impossible that someone might have conducted, maybe not the king himself, but somebody might have conducted a, a Seker Hemat um, uh, ritual. Um, but I, would, I, I don't know and I'd love to. Another question on the striking of the ball ritual, and if we know what the ball was made of. I think that they were made of a variety of things because we, um, m many peoples, um, uh, many museums have <clears throat> examples of them in their collections made of faience, um, and they're, they're really about the size of a, um, or a little smaller than a tennis ball. Um, and uh, the faience ones um, are divided in sections that alternate black and turquoise um, as if you were looking at the uh, parts of an eye. Um, so what the ones would have been used in the actual ceremony, we assume would not be faience, but they might very well have been um, of a harder material um, even stone that would have perhaps been um, painted uh, to have that similar look? It's a good question. Oops, sorry. I've I'll repeat it again. Oh. Could the hieroglyphs for drunkenness be translated as the concept of hysteria instead? Uh, um, I mean, I think it means intoxicated. Um, and um, so, I mean, we pretty much know that tech means to be drunk. Um, it, but it's a good drunk uh, it, when it's used in a religious setting that being drunk doesn't always mean 
good good because we find it as an explanation for why workers didn't show up at work uh, in lists, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, when they're, you know, and clearly that would get them in trouble. Um, but um, it, it very clearly does mean actually uh, intoxicated. Now, when it gets that metaphorical meaning to be intoxicated by the goddess or the god, um, uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to suggest that it means hysterical, but rather um, in love beyond uh, um, one's thinking. Um, one might note that um, it, 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 in the old kingdom, um, there, you know, when they were building pyramids, there must have been a necessity to try and do anything to encourage uh, people doing the building um, to, uh, uh, to enjoy their work. And so you actually have work gangs um, and the, that have their own names. And one of them is um, uh, Mycerinus is drunkenness. Um, and uh, he's also, another one is called My, Mycerinus is joy. So they are very parallel in meaning. But um, I, I, I think that Hysteria is not quite the meaning. Another uh, hieroglyph related question. Um, the lotus determinative you mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, um, what does it represent? The lotus itself or something else? Well, lotus has, uh, lotus is, uh, uh, as a hieroglyph, um, it can simply mean the, the lotus, the, the, the flower. Um, but for the Egyptians, the, the lotus does have a symbolic meaning that is associated um, with particularly solar rebirth. Um, to some extent, that seems to be connected to the fact that um, the closed lotus can have a small tip um, on it that is reddened. Um, and then as it opens, um, you see inside and uh, uh, that redness. Um, there's a, the, the offspring god of, um, uh, of Sekhmet and Ta is called Nefertim. And he, he is uh, the lotus god and he sits on a lotus. Um, so lotus is very much associated with uh, with rebirth and um, uh, in addition to being a flower. So when people have it dangling uh, on their forehead, when they hold it in their hands, when they're offered it in a bouquet, it means that that's probably uh, a water plant that's part of this context for real, but it also implies all of the symbolic meaning in addition. Uh, there was actually another lotus question I just saw, but you just <laughs> answered it. So. Oh, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> um, Jemma Rakrock, now some Sekhmet statue questions. Um, from Charles, how many Sekhmet statues were, were made by Amenhotep III? Um, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> um, you know, it used to be said when Yoyot wrote his article in the 80s, um, we were at that time thinking, 730, um, which would be twice the days of the year. Twice 365 would be 730. The way he came to that uh, as a number is that Sekhmet, um, in her role of governing the sort of mechanisms of the world, um, also was a, could, could attribute an either good or bad fate to any single day of the year. So you would have both a good possibility and a bad possibility for any day. And Yoyot suggested that the litany using the Sekhmet statues would then be done uh, 730 times um, in, in order to come up with the, the proper uh, outcome. Um, however, um, at this stage, we know that it's way more than 730. Um, 
already we know that at the Moot Temple in the middle of the 19th century, there were more than 550 uh, statues at the Moot Temple. But now, um, uh, Hurig Seruzian, who is uh, just doing an incredible work um, at the funerary temple of Amenhotep III, Komil Hetan, um, has several hundred uh, Sekhmet statues. Um, so, <clears throat> so we're beyond 730. So I don't know what the actual number was. Uh, on that note, with Komal Hatan and Moot Temple, we have a question from Hassan, Hassan asking, um, are they similar uh, or is it worship or something else? You mean, are the Sekhmet statues? The Sekhmet statues. The Sekhmet. Yes, they, they are. They're, they're, they're basically the same size uh, and um, uh, as most of the statues, you know, the image that we're looking at, I think if people are still able to see the screen, um, there's only uh, there's only a few of these over oversized uh, Sekhmet statues. The vast majority of them, if we were to measure them in, in American terms, um, would be around eight feet in height with their bases. Um, so, uh, two and a half meters or thereabouts. And um, so <clears throat> the, um, um, uh, but the ones that they have, um, th there's really nothing to, uh, to separate them uh, from the ones that we have at the Moot Temple, except that uh, having come more recently from the ground, um, many of them have beautiful paint preserved something that we only have on the large uh, statue um, at the Moot Temple where her eyes are still red. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, they're all very much of the same type. Question from Olivia, going back to the Festival of Drunkenness. Um, she says, I might have mixed this up, but is the beautiful Feast of the Valley a version of the Festival of Drunkenness? Um, are they mostly the same festival type and place specific? Okay, great. So this goes back to the uh, calendar um, at the entranceway uh, to the Moot Temple, where it says that the, it, it goes through the different main feasts. And two of them are defined as, uh, as drunkenness festivals. One is the, the one at the beginning of the year, and the other one is the valley, the festival of the valley, where it says that, um, that uh, it's associated with her having the red, uh, the red beverage, uh, either, either a brew or a wine. Um, and um, so, so at that point, they're even also referring to her in her boat, because of course the Festival of the Valley requires a movement from the Moot Temple on the east bank to the west side um, uh, to visit uh, the, the temples of deceased kings. And, and uh, it is the people who live on the east and the west um, who accompany the goddesses and the god statues to the West Bank um, who continue having this festival. They celebrate it inside the Moot, Best Moot Temple, probably only by the highest elites, but on the west side of the river, um, they go to the temple of, Hat, of uh, Hatshepsut, and after there are rituals there and everyone um, participates or as many who participate as allowed in because it's a small space. Um, they then leave and go to their families' tombs, uh, tomb chapels. And at those tomb chapels, they gather and they drink separately together in order to themselves and their family um, have an epiphany with the goddess Hathor and with their deceased ancestors. I hope that's been made clear. So, so the beautiful Feast of the Valley is a festival of drunkenness, but it has sort of two parts, one that takes place on the east and the rest on the west. 
We have, by the way, we have a lot more questions. How much more time do you think you have? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not going. Oh, anywhere. okay. All right. Good. Um, uh, another question on um, the beer wine. Did Ladna, Ladnum added to wine, which probably originated in the land of Punt, had in itself any solar connection? Uh, I wonder if the fragrant spice sacrificed the wine during the festival of drunkenness. S say the last one again. The it, says last the of of, it says the land of Punt had strong solar connections, so I wonder if this fragrant spice sacrificed the wine during the festival of drunkenness. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Gotcha. Um, um, it, it's possible, but it's not something that. Um, I'm aware of as, um, as, as an offering named. Now there are um, the reliefs and decoration um, at, of the Feast of the Valley at Darrow Bakri on the third level um, that is in the process of being made available. Um, so that might be um, a possible place that, that we could learn um, of that, um, but I'm not aware of it in uh, being specified. Question from Rob. Um, Metamood is three or so miles distant from Karnak. How did it fit into the overall activities of the festival? Well, it had its own festival. So um, at Metamud, the, um, the so-called consort of the main god, who was Montu, um, she was one of these Uraeus um, lioness goddesses, Rayet Taui. Um, so they celebrated a drunkenness festival at the Metamud temple um, separately. I don't know the date. I don't think we have the date for that, but I'm guessing that it is likely to be the one in the first month of the year, the Thoth Festival. Um, but it could very well be the one uh, it linked up um, with the Valley Feast. Um, but the one at Metamud, for which we only have the evidence in the Ptolemaic period, um, we don't have a connection for its celebration with other temples in, in Thebes at the moment. We just know, we just know that it, it, it represents the order of that type of festival, which I try to make the point very plainly that a communal gathering to begin with is not standard Egyptian religion uh, practice. So to have such things and to have them led by people who are not the normal priests of the temple um, means that it derives from a different source. And, um, and so that's what we're really talking about in trying to utilize the Metamud uh, Festival. I have a question from Hytham also on uh, the Drunkenness Festival, and if this was done throughout dynastic history or not. Okay, that's a wonderful question. Um, there are hints that it probably was around um, almost from the very beginning. I suspect strongly that it was probably uh, predated <laughs> most of the kinds of state um, religious uh, festivals um, that we know of, um, and that for that reason, that's one of the reasons why it maintained its connection to the kinship system uh, and to ancestor veneration. Um, it did not have a stratified hierarchy that you had men and women together of equal involvement. Um, and um, our colleague Nozomo Kawai um, uh, is uh, at, uh, uh, um, uh, discovered a place of celebration um, for a lioness uh, drunkenness type of fest uh, that dates uh, as early as perhaps the third dynasty um, and was renewed during the old kingdom. Um, 
and that was probably connected to the goddess Bastet um, uh, rather than uh, Sekhmet at that time. Um, there have been suggestions of a pre-dynastic version of this, and I would totally buy into that belief because, as I say, I do think that the structure, the form of its organization, and the connection to ancestor veneration uh, all suggest that this is something that is uh, a very old in Egyptian history. What, what we're seeing in the Valley Festival um, is, its is its being combined with a state version of celebration. Uh, another uh, similar question. Um, how did the drunkenness festival affect the rest of the population? Did religion smooth over the socially unstabilizing impacts? Yeah, I think that um, that's probably a good way to, um, to put it. These were, these were not uh, common festivals. Um, and um, they were um, almost certainly people had the opportunity uh, to either opt in or opt out. Um, as I made a point of saying that they even go so far as to monumentalize the fact that some of the guests at the banquets refused to drink and some didn't. Um, and yet it doesn't seem to have prevented them being there. Um, so there's, um, so there's good, good indications that they, um, they tried to balance it. On the other hand, um, it, once you reach the, the end of Dynasty 18, and we do see this, festi this type of festival celebrated in the tomb of Neferhotep from the reign of Ai, um, it's hard to find it documented in the same way with drunkenness as its focus um, in the period of the Ramesside era. Um, it does appear that it comes in and out of fashion um, over time. And um, I don't think it ever goes away, but I think that it it does seem that it, um, at some periods, there's less of the drinking and more of the simple communion with ancestors. Uh, question from Andrea, also about the drunkenness ritual. Uh, do you think there exists some connection between Bartolissi with drunkenness ritual since <laughs> wine BB and red wine are mentioned. Um, well, I have to be honest and say that um, I would have to go back and look at list C because it's not like on the tip of my tongue. Um, but um, the um, You know, just because wine is mentioned, I'm not sure where that gets me. So I would need to go back and look at Barta and, and before I could really give you a response. A uh, question from Donald. Is there a difference between a Morris sex and ritual sex in either the visual depiction or in textual descriptions? I need you to read that one one, one more time. I, I, is there a difference between a Morris sex and ritual sex in either the visual descriptions or in the textual descriptions? What, what is a more? A more sex. A Morris. A Morris sex. A Morris? Amorous. 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 Sorry. Is that amorous? I think it's a typo. Yeah. All right, is there a difference between amorous sex in, say it again? And ritual sex. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> whether that would be the case or not. Um, the only thing I can answer, which is really insufficient here, um, is that the word used, um, uh, when we get it, um, is the word that really means 
have sex, not, it's not a gentler word than that. Um, for example, the divine birth um, uh, inscriptions that we have, they use, they use a, a, a slight way of, of uh, getting around it. Um, you know, and they say that God goes to her and his love travels through her body, um, even though it does specifically use a word hod, which means, you know, sort of using that male member. But, um, but the word used in, um, uh, in the drunkenness festivals is neck, and neck is the word that, you know, we would use the F word for. Uh, a question from Iris. Would the depictions of the women holding and pouring the liquid causing the visions perhaps be an indication of the preparation of such um, psychotropic substances and the portions uh, was in the hands of female herbalists? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I wouldn't think that's um, unlikely. Um, it does seem that um, they, the preparation has to have been certainly done well in advance because um, at least in the banquets where we, which we see in the 18th dynasty, they really do appear to be pressing those plant oils um, into uh, containers so that, that they could more easily distribute it. And, um, but when we look at the Metamud hymn, um, what you have is actually the organizer whose, whose title is really the guy who's sort of the head uh, of the musician groups, um, he comes in carrying the plants. Um, so I think that's more likely to be um, just to remind us that the plants are there. And then we even see that represented um, on the relief um, of the women holding the plants in their hands as they come in. But almost certainly, um, the preparation and grinding of it down into oils was done earlier. As women, female herbalists, I, I just can't tell you. I don't know for sure. Um, I don't, uh, that's all. Question from Andrea on if you can elaborate on the colors on the Sekhmet statues. Mm. So I've only seen a few um, of these, so Hurig would really be the one uh, to talk about this, but um, uh, one of the ones um, not only has uh, red eyes, which are, I even showed one of her Sekhmet heads um, at the very, very, one of the very last slides, which the eyes are just bright red, um, but the this one had um, the the necklace it was wearing was completely painted, and um, it had a combination of um, blue, red, and yellow. So that we're looking at the sort of normal beads that you would see on a broad broad collar um, uh, in Egypt. So that's uh, the primary things that I've seen so far. All right, we have two more questions. Um, <laughs> almost there. Uh, is there any connection between Poont's journey and bringing the eye of the sun god with the festival of drunkenness? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, certainly, this is the origin, as we've already, you know, heard from her question or earlier um, of important incense and spices. Um, and um, it's also true that the punt reliefs at Hatshepsut's temple are uh, located um, in the immediately next door to the Hathor chapel. Um, and being that they come from uh, the south, I think it's, it, it's a very sensible uh, suggestion. Uh, 
unmute. All right, last question. Uh, do the hieroglyphs say specifically that some people refuse to participate in the drinking or that their presence provides another function? Do you have the wording? Okay, so what I have uh, is not that I refuse, but instead what we have is the, <clears throat> the people talking to the person whose hand is up like this. So the butler says, you know, go ahead and drink. I will stay with you. Something, by the way, we know from the demotic drinking songs much later that they had a person who was designated um, to take care of people who got drunk. Um, and then in addition to the fact that we have in more than one of those inscriptions, the butler saying, don't worry, I'll take care of you and go ahead and drink. Don't, and he says, and one of them says, don't be tiresome. Um, and uh, it, we also have other members, other guests saying, it's okay, go ahead and drink. Um, and then one of them has very little patience and says, if you're not going to pass the cup to me because I'm thirsty. <laughs> so, um, so although we don't have the words come out of the mouth of the refuser, we have everybody around it indicating that that's what's happening. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for your lecture. I um, want to thank Dr. Bryan for also taking all the questions. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, if you are interested in supporting work like Dr. Bryan's, as well as RC's efforts to research and conserve Egypt's past, I urge you to visit rc.org and become a member or make a contribution today. Um, we rely on your support to make our work possible. So thank you all again for joining us and I invite you all to join us at our next public lecture on October 31st. So thank you and have a good evening. Bye.